Hello, and welcome to the Law School Toolbox Podcast. Today, we're going to be talking about getting ready for the bar exam. Ooh. 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 <laughs> <laughs> Your Law School Toolbox hosts are Allison Monahan and Lee Burgess. That's me. We're here to demystify the law school and early legal career experience, so you'll be the best law student and lawyer you can be. We're the co-creators of the Law School Toolbox, Bar Exam Toolbox, the Catapult Conference, and the Trebuchet Legal Career Site. Allison also runs the Girl's Guide to Law School. If you enjoy the show, please leave a review on iTunes. And if you have any questions, don't hesitate to reach out to us. You can reach us via the contact form on lawschooltoolbox.com, and we'd love to hear from you. So with that, let's get started. Welcome back to today's Law School Toolbox podcast. We are going to be talking about a very important topic, thinking ahead for getting ready for the bar exam. Now, if you're listening to this particular episode as a 1L or even a 2L, you might be thinking you could skip it because the bar is years off, but that is a huge mistake. It's actually important to keep bar prep on your radar throughout your law school experience because it'll make sure you're ready for exam day with a personalized plan that works for you. And there are just certain things that you really don't want to overlook. So before we dive into the details, Lee, what do you think is the biggest mistake law students make when thinking about bar prep? Oh, I think the biggest mistake is really thinking that a one size fits all approach is absolutely going to work for them. Because I think that's the message that is given at law schools uh, and maybe by certain bar providers. Um, right. And there's just kind of this thing like, oh, you don't have to worry about the bar. You can just take this course and like everybody passes. Right. Just take this course and do everything they tell you and you'll be fine. Um, which is true for a portion of the population, but. Well, the portion who passed. Um, right? <laughs> but I think a lot of students seem to just throw out all this knowledge they have about their personal needs and their personal strengths and weaknesses. You know, if you're somebody who's um, who's always worked with a tutor, you know, since high school math, because you just need somebody to give you that personalized attention, why do you think that you're going to be fine just listening to audio lectures to get ready for the bar exam without any personalized help? Or if you're somebody who, you know, who hates listening to things and doesn't retain any information listening to lectures, why do you think that that would be the best way to prepare for the bar? So you just have to keep in mind what your strengths and weaknesses are um, and evaluate your options so when you take the dive into your bar prep, you actually have an approach that you're pretty sure is going to reflect your needs. Yeah, it's interesting. It's like people give up all of their sort of critical reasoning facilities when they start thinking about the bar and it suddenly... You know, it was like your first semester of 1L, you get all these sort of scare tactics of like, you got to buy now, but and like, oh, okay, I'll sign up, I'll sign up. And it's like, why? Like, I, I, don't know, I just remember kind of being mystified by the whole thing. I was sort of like, well, how would I even know? Like, I've never even been to law school. Like, how would I know what's going to work for me three years from now? Like, I'm so confused by this uh-huh. whole thing. I mean, it makes sense from a marketing perspective, like get them in early. You know? <laughs> right, before they but, have critical thinking skills. Right, but also before you know, yeah, like what you need to do. I mean, for me, you know, you mentioned listening to lectures. The idea that I would sit in a classroom or like listen to a tape or you know whatever on my iPad, blah blah blah, for like I don't even know, like four, six, eight hours a day, mm. struck me as like an absolute living hell. I was like, you could not <laughs> like not only will I not pay thousands of dollars for this, like you couldn't pay me enough to do this, right? And so I never signed up for Barbary. I mean, you can read the post about how I think you can pass a bar without Barbary. Um, ha, thanks, Barbary. Yeah, we'll, we'll go ahead and link um, to that in the show notes. <laughs> yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll just put those posts in the show notes. Thanks, Barbary. Um, they're some of the most popular ones on the site, actually. Mm-hmm. Um, but no, the reality is, like, I knew that that, you know, there's nothing against Barbary particularly, but I just knew that was going to drive me completely insane. And I wasn't going to learn anything. And I was still going to have to do whatever I would do to learn the material anyway. So... I just skipped it. Yeah. And people thought this was crazy. Yeah. It's it's a lot of fear, I think, around this topic. I mean, I call it the culture of fear. It's being fed by a lot of different um, institutions and individuals. I think the uh, schools want you to be scared to encourage you to study. The bar providers want you to be scared to encourage you to spend a lot of money on bar prep. Um, but... That doesn't mean that you shouldn't make smart decisions for you just because it's scary. <laughs> and it's, you yeah, know. I think you'd have to separate out 
you know, that fear, which is a legitimate fear of like, this is a lot of material to learn. I have to like figure this out, you know, like I've got a lot, I've got to work hard and make sure that, you know, I do as well as I can and take this test once hopefully from the sort of fear mongering Mm -hmm. of, you know, if you don't sign up as a one L, your life is over. It's like, that's ridiculous. I mean, (laughs) it doesn't make any sense. (laughs) Yes, 100%. So if you're a 3L, we kind of have compiled a list of things that we think you should be thinking about now um, going into your bar prep. And probably the first is what we've already started talking about is selecting a bar review provider. So there are a lot of things you should consider when selecting um, a bar review provider. I think the first thing is really cost. Um, They range, there's a huge range um, of costs for a bar review. Well, and um, I think the good news is there's some newer options that weren't necessarily available when you and I were in law school. Right. That have, you know, have increased competition. I think they probably made everyone's products better. I agree. Um, you know, it's not, I mean, it's still sort of a monopoly business or, you know, biopoly. I don't know. I never <laughs> took antitrust, but, you know, there are a couple <laughs> of big players. And then you have the sort of upstarts who are fighting for market share. Right. And I think, you know, I think that's a better position for people who are taking the bar to be in than when you just have like one behemoth. For sure. And you, it, you know, it used to be that pretty much if you had a law firm job, your firm was just going to pay for your bar prep. So it yeah. didn't really matter what you spent, you were going to get money. Uh, and that's not the same reality for a lot of folks. And so if you are paying out of pocket for bar prep, um, you need to think, do I have two, three, or more thousand dollars to spend on this experience? Or, you know, do I need to explore some of these other options? So I only pay, you know, a thousand dollars. Because one of the things I think people don't take into consideration is it's actually very expensive to even sit for the test beyond yeah. even studying for it. You know, it's hundreds and hundreds of dollars to um, file your, you know, moral character applications, hundreds and hundreds of dollars just to apply to take the test. There's a laptop fee. There's a hotel if you want to stay by the testing center. I mean, um, there's a Not lot. To mention, like the two or three months you're taking off of doing anything else productive oh, to study. Yeah, just that too. <laughs> so, you know, it's very smart to just think through cost and and pick something that is going to match, um, you know, your needs, but also you know, not make it so you can't feed yourself during the bar exam. Yeah. And I think sometimes there's this tendency to think like, oh, if I just like, you know, buy the most expensive option that like it's the magic bullet is going to guarantee that I pass. I mean, just numbers wise, it's obvious that's not true. Right. I mean, if you look at the pass rate of the California bar, the pass rate is basically more or less like, you know, the pass rates of the leading bar prep companies. Yeah. Why? Because they've prepared most of the people who take the test. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. So it's it's, it's not a, it's not a magic bullet just spending money. It is not. It is not. Um, and I think the way that you kind of make these decisions of what you need is what Allison was saying about her experience. It was important to think about what her own needs were. You know, think about what type of learner you are. Are those video lectures going to be a good use of your time? It's not a couple of hours of video lectures, people. It's like four hours a day, five days a week for like six weeks. It's a I mean, lot. For me, it was just, it just seems so much more efficient to just get the books and read them. Right. You know, exactly. <laughs> was like, and that works wait, for a spend, lot of people. If I spend know? like four hours, like, you know, and I, you know, I, but when I took the Massachusetts bar originally, like I bought, it wasn't like I went in cold, like I bought a bar prep program. It was just way less expensive. Um, and you know, they gave me materials that were pretty condensed. And so, you know, in basically a day or maybe two days for bigger topics, like I could learn an entire topic. Mm-hmm. Um, and you know, that's basically all the time I really had because I wasn't studying for that long. I was working the summer before I took the bar. And, you know, I also think people need to take into consideration how much accountability you need. You know, yeah. some people, I think, like to go to a physical classroom and listen to a lecture just because it makes them go somewhere. You know, uh, some people really can't manage their own schedule for that long doing things they don't want to do, <laughs> which nobody right. wants to study for the bar. So, um, you know, I think you have to really think through – you know, what are your individualized needs and what prep plan is going to match those needs? Um, well, but I think you also have to be careful. I agree with you. Like, I think there's some value in like having a schedule and getting out of the house and like going someplace every day at a certain time. But you have to be careful about is that all you're doing? Yeah. Exactly. You know, are you, are you doing the easy things? Like, it's pretty easy to sit and listen to a lecture. Like, it's boring, yes. but it's not hard. Yes. You know, the hard work is, like, really digging in, like, teaching, outlining the material for yourself, teaching yourself the material, working on practice problems. You know, if, if you're not in a program that's basically going to force you to do that, you might have some problems. It's true. I mean, I talk to a lot of people who fail the bar. 
a lot, (laughs) a lot, a lot, a lot. And one of the most common things I hear from folks is I ask them, how much did you practice? And they're like, well, I wrote a few essays. Okay, that's not enough. So everybody needs to be practicing. So you need to look at your study plan and say, is there going to be practice? Is there accountability for that practice? And am I setting myself up to do that hard work? Nobody likes writing bar essays, but it is the biggest single thing you can do to get the job done. Well, and I think you have to look too at a lot of the programs, like what kind of feedback you're getting. Mm-hmm. And the reality, you know, a lot of them sort of, I mean, one idea they said like, oh, you can send your essays to tutors and whatever, but like, are these people any good? I who knows? And often, how much time do they have to spend to give you different levels of feedback? You know, I think sometimes people think, well, I'll submit it to get feedback. And that's great if you get that feedback and say, this isn't the d- level of detailed feedback that I need. I need yeah, somebody to like redline my like, work. Yeah, you're going to get like a plus or a minus. And it's right. like, oh, okay. Or you might get some, <laughs> you know, comment bubbles on your page. And then if you leave that scratching your head saying like, well, this isn't really working for me, then it's time to change course and find some other resources to help you out. Because again, I talk to people and they say, well, I knew it was going poorly but I didn't know what to do to change course. And that's, you don't want to do that. You want to put everything on pause and say, I don't feel like it's going well. I want to evaluate my options and get the help that I need to be successful. Yeah, I just, you know, I know from experience, it's really hard to be like the outlier in bar prep. I mean, I'm a pretty independently minded person. And even (laughs) then, you know, because I was working and everyone else I was working with, they all went to Barbary at night and they were Mm -hmm. like, you're going to fail the bar. Yep. Like, oh, yeah. And I was like, it's the Massachusetts bar. It's a 90% pass rate. I don't think I'm going to fail. <laughs> but, you know, there is this culture of, like, you, if you're not doing what everyone else is doing, you are definitely going to fail the bar. And, you know, it takes a lot of, like, fortitude to stand up and go, you know what? That sounds great for whatever, if it's working for you, but that's not going to work for me. And I'm doing this other thing. And I think it's, I think I'm going to be successful. Yeah, I agree. But it's hard. It's really hard. It is hard. And it's also being honest about where your weaknesses are. So, for instance, I hate multiple choice. Um, I always have. That's the only reason I passed the bar. I know. Which is why, <laughs> which is why, I mean, I've forgiven you for that part of your personality that you love multiple choice. You're very good at it. But, um, you know, if you're like me and you really don't like multiple choice, then you know, you might need to invest in more multiple choice practice. Adaptabar is a tool that we often recommend to students. We've linked to my reviews of Adaptabar in our show notes. But it's just one example of, you know, a student being able to say, I need more help with the MBE multiple choice portion. So I'm going to go get that help somewhere else. Yeah. Um, and that was that was actually the main reason I signed up for the course I did is that they had like an early version of Adaptabar type of things where they did sort of spaced repetition, and it was a computerized version. And so, you know, you basically were constantly getting the questions that you had missed consistently, and that's not fun. You know, it's really hard work. But it makes you a lot better than just taking a random set of 30 MBE questions. It's like if they're giving you 25 questions out of the 30 that you have missed before, you're eventually going to stop missing those questions. Yeah, exactly. And it's going to make you a lot better, a lot faster than just randomly, like, oh, I'm assigned to do 100 questions. I guess I'll just sit down and do 100 random MBE questions. For sure. So all of this should just convince you that the one-size-fits-all approach may not be the right answer. So if you're a 3L and you're in law school and you're thinking about what your bar prep options are, open your mind, investigate lots of different options because it may end up being better for you in the end. Yeah, Uh, because the goal is to pass. It doesn't matter how you get there. Yeah, nobody's going to know how you got there. (laughs) All anybody cares about is whether your name's on the pass list. Exactly. Um. Okay, some schools actually have some bar prep programs, um, depending on your school. Sometimes uh, certain bar review providers actually run programs at your school. Um, Depends on the law school. But the ABA actually allows law schools to give class credit for um, prep classes. So I've taught some of these classes. um, And my law school had one on just the performance test portion of the California bar. And um, I taught another class that was more like a survey of kind of the overall California bar. So when you start bar prep, you've kind of done some of this work before. But you should at least look at these classes and strategically evaluate if they will work for you. But they generally are a good idea um, because, one, you're already paying for them. So it's included in your, um, your tuition. But it also 
gives you a bit of a leg up um, going into bar prep that you're not starting from scratch. And sometimes they tailor those classes to what the general student body at that school is struggling with or has struggled with in the past. And so it can it can be a good targeted approach um, and you should take advantage of it. So find out what those classes are at your school and just think about when you want to take them. You usually want to take them your last semester of law school. Yeah, I think it's just a good idea. To, you know, anything you can do to sort of avoid that overwhelm of like, oh my gosh, I have how much new information to learn in the next eight weeks? I'm going to lose my mind. Yeah. Um, you know, if you've seen a lot of the stuff before, particularly if you haven't actually taken a class on it, but you're not, I mean, no one, almost no one's going to show up to the bar exam having taken a class on every single thing that could possibly be tested just because they have a very wide range of things that could be tested. Exactly. And that's another thing we want you to start thinking about, whether you're a 2L or a 3L, is uh, what bar electives that you want to take. So bar electives, if you've never heard this term before, is a class that is on a topic that is tested on the bar exam. Right. So, um, for example, in California, it might be community property. Right. Um, wills and in trusts. a lot of states, like wills and trusts is a big one. Like that's a sort of complicated area and yeah. it's on most bar exams. Corporations, most, partnerships. Yeah. yeah things, things like, like that. that. Yeah. So you want to f- like see what your bar elective offerings are at your school. And I wouldn't recommend only taking bar electives while you're in law school because that would just be misery. You should take some yeah. fun electives too. But um, you do want to take a good chunk of them. Um I really think you should take all of the core um, subjects that are tested on the multiple choice portion of the bar, which is called the MBE, uh, which is evidence, criminal procedure and criminal law, contracts, civil procedure, torts, property, and constitutional law. Many of these classes are probably going to be required in law school, but um, you know, you should take evidence. Everybody should take evidence. <laughs> yeah, like I took evidence. I did. Someone finally told me, like, you should really take that. I think the judge like required it too. That I was working mm-hmm. for. But so I took that my last semester. But I never took criminal procedure, and I really struggled on the Fourth Amendment questions yeah. on the MBE because I had taken this other class with this absolutely insane professor who thought that like it was like a war on terror seminar, and she literally thought that like the police should be able to do anything they wanted. So she just told us <laughs> that's what the law was. Um, <laughs> So I I literally missed every single Fourth Amendment MBE question for like weeks Mm -hmm. until I was like, oh, no, this is not the law at all. She just made that up. Yeah. But I think I would have been better off. Like, I would have been a lot more comfortable if I'd taken criminal procedure. Yeah. And it's just like an interesting class to know something about. And it's like one of those life skills classes, I think. Yeah. It's like when your phone rings, like that's going to be what they're asking about. Yeah, somebody got pulled over at a traffic stop and they went into the trunk or whatever. Yeah. <laughs> that's, it's that. And uh, I had a family law professor who said everyone should take basic family law because that's the se- other set of phone calls that you always get from your friends. Exactly. Um, no, I, I've done a lot of like semi pro bono, like divorce filings for friends. <laughs> <laughs> Like, um, I'm not officially representing you, but I'll help you fill out the form. There you go. So, you know, you should just make a list of the bar subjects that are tested in the jurisdiction you're planning on taking and see, you know, where the gaps might be. Um, sometimes students will say, oh, well, I wasn't planning on taking, you know, all of these classes. And then they'll make a list. And I'm like, that's too many not to have taken. Some right. are just smart to have taken. But, um, you know, you, sh- you don't want to have a huge chunk of the bar be... You don't want to have taken none of them. Yeah, you don't want to have taken none of them. So be smart about it um, and be thoughtful about it as you put your schedule together. Yeah, but you probably don't need like commercial paper as a specific class no. unless like, you know, you're going into some weird area. No, or in California, I had taken community property, but I did not take wills and trusts. Um, and that's another one that like I kind of wish I had taken. Yeah, I almost took it my last semester, but I switched it for a federalism in the family seminar. You know, it was, I didn't, a, it was a tough call. I didn't love the professor who was teaching wills and trusts that semester, and so I opted out of it. But every time I do something like work on our wills and, tr- <laughs> and do yeah, our it's, like, it's again one of those like it would be useful to know, kind of like you know personal income tax. Oh, go! Like, oh, it would have been useful to know something about. This. I know. <laughs> I wish, really wish, I'd taken Fed tax too, and I wish I'd paid more attention to corporations now that I own yeah, my own business. But I didn't. Yeah, I don't these know. are things you learn after after you have no longer opportunities to just take classes in law school. Yeah, but the good news is you can always just go to the bar books and read them if That's you really true. want a primer. You can, you can be a quick study. Um, another thing that I think people forget that they need to do to get ready for the bar exam is actually fill out extensive paperwork uh, for bar admission. So the state bars don't just, you know, shake so your like hands. you pass the test and they're like, congratulations, you're right. a lawyer. <laughs> there are other boxes that need to be checked. And typically that includes some sort of moral character is what it's called in California. Um 
Do you remember what it's called back east, Allison? They call it different um, things, different jurisdictions. Yeah, they call it, I remember in Massachusetts, there's this crazy requirement where you have to get like a personal letter attesting mm. to your character from someone who's practicing law in the state. Wow. Which like I had never lived there. It was kind of a big problem. Mm -hmm. (laughs) That is pretty crazy. So So, there may be these weird requirements. I mean, we've gotten emails from people who are like, I've passed the bar, but there's some crazy requirement that I can't fulfill. And it's like, you want to know that in advance. Exactly. So find out what those requirements are and take steps to do them. For things- And they're gonna require like your entire life history. I mean, ever, literally every address that you've ever lived at in your adult life, including college. Mm-hmm. One tip, um, a good place to find these addresses, either your credit report or where you've sent Amazon packages. It's very true. Thank you, Amazon, for keeping <laughs> <laughs> records so you're of my like, what life. was that co-op I lived in in Berkeley for like three months? Mm-hmm. Oh, it's on my credit report. Yep. Yeah, it takes a long time to go through this stuff. Um, and- and then certain states, they kind of want you to do it. I mean, I don't, you don't have to, but they prefer that you do it early, right? Like, doesn't California want you to do something as a first year? Well, I mean, you just kind of fill out a form online on, as your first year. That's not a big thing. Um, right. But, but like, I mean, if you didn't do it, I remember there was some like thing because yeah. I hadn't told them I was going to take it. I think, I mean, the moral character application took a while. I mean, I remember. Oh, like forever. Yeah. I remember spending hours and hours doing it and you don't want to make mistakes because. You don't want to make mistakes and you don't want to lie. Yes. Don't lie. Do not and... lie. Do not omit relevant information. No. Don't, that is... Like this is not a place to get cute about what you're leaving off. No. And sometimes, you know, you might have situations come up where you're unsure how to um, report it and then you need to have time to go get advice um from someone who is more knowledgeable than us to yeah, there, there are actual lawyers who specify who like who specifically practice like solely in the area of like attorney admissions exactly so you know i like to say go ahead and try and do this stuff like in the fall of your third year because also sometimes it can take a while for your moral character application to make its way through and you would never want that to be standing in the way of you getting your license i mean like when you yeah, it's a total pain i mean like i took the california bar and i hadn't bothered i was already a lawyer so it didn't really matter but i hadn't bothered filing my moral character until afterwards and it took like months yeah. before i was actually admitted in california right i mean once you pass the bar you want to like celebrate and my school did this very nice swearing in ceremony and we all went and you can't do that if you yeah you can't do it if you haven't done the paperwork haven't done the paperwork and if you haven't taken the mpre oh the mpre the ethics bar um i think almost every single state requires the mpre it's given a few times a year over the weekend. It's a few hours. I think it's around three hours. Um, So it's like a morning um, activity. You got to study for it. It's multiple choice. Um, Most people like to wait until after they've taken ethics or professional responsibility, which is fine. But you have to study for it like you need to study for the driving test. You can't just go in cold and just say, well, I guess I can guess the right answer. Because it was harder than I thought. Yeah, they test some really detailed stuff. Like you Um, have to know it. (laughs) You do. So you need to practice. But lucky for you, unlike regular bar prep, a lot of resources are free for the MPRE. A lot of bar prep providers provide you with MPRE materials in order for you to try out their bar prep services to see if you will like them. That's one of the other reasons why to delay um, taking you know, deciding which barber review provider, because you can kind of shop around and see what you like. So use their free resources to see which one you find is going to be the best to help you for the MPRE. Yeah, definitely. And the other thing is that you, you probably want to schedule this. So if you do not pass on the first time, you have time to take it again before yes, you graduate. Very Because I remember I, of course, as I always would, had put this off until the very last possible <laughs> admission. And when I was in law school, you know, like a day or two before, I kind of got the book and was like, oh, wow, this is way harder than I expected it to be. I'm really not prepared for it. And I might fail it. Yeah. And if I had, you know, I would have had to take it again, like after I took the bar and that would have been a total pain. So, yes. and I, you know, even at Columbia, I had friends who failed it the first time they took it. So not you know, meaning luckily- you're not ethical. Just No, well, you know, it's just a test. test. It's like things exactly. happen. Things do happen. Um, and, you know, so luckily in those cases, they had taken it earlier and they were taking it for the second time when I was taking it for the first time. Yeah. So don't leave it to last minute, please, please, please. Okay. Uh, what about finances? Because I think another place people forget to think ahead is that you are likely going to want to study full time if you are taking the exam for the first time, especially. And so you're going to need money to survive over the summer. Um while you're studying and sometimes even after that while you're waiting for bar results because it can be very hard to get a job while you're waiting for bar results 
Yeah, I mean, basically, unless you have like a firm job or you know, government position or something waiting for you, almost no one is going to hire you as an attorney. Well, right. they can't hire you as an attorney, but they're not going to hire you at all until yeah. you get your bar results. Because, I mean, think about it from their perspective. Why wouldn't they just wait a few months and just make sure you pass? Yeah, and some firms won't even start their um, their official start dates until September or October. You know, so you still might have like a while before you're going to get that first paycheck. <laughs> so yeah, definitely. You need to kind of figure out what that is going to look like. Um, some people borrow money. They call them bar loans. Um, some people decide to, you know, move home and live with family or friends to try and save money um, so they can really eliminate as many financial stressors as they can. Yeah. I mean, I had friends who, like, worked as waitresses at night, you know, after studying all day, which seemed hard, but, you know, they were like, well, it allows me to eat. So right. So that's just what I'm going to have to do. So whatever your personal situation is, you definitely need to think through how this is going to work because – I've seen financial stressors that were avoidable really derail someone studying. And that's what you don't want. Right. I think this is a time where like, you know, to the extent possible, like you really want to have your emergency fund in place, for example. It's Mm -hmm. like, you know, if you start having car trouble or like your cat gets sick or whatever, like these are things that can become really a problem if you are dealing with like a huge meltdown situation that could have been avoided in the middle of your bar prep. Right. Exactly. Um. And those are great examples, too, of stress coming up during bar prep. <laughs> so Yeah, this is going to be a stressful experience for everyone. It, it is. It doesn't matter who you are. It no. is an incredibly stressful experience. It is probably, studying for the bar is probably some of the least pleasant, like, weeks of my life. Yeah, they aren't high on my list, no. Um, so if you don't have some skills to manage stress now, it's a great idea to think ahead and um, start practicing taking care of yourself. You know, try things like meditation. Try Um, making sure you have exercise in your plan. And if you are someone who really, really studies with anxiety, struggles with anxiety, please reach out and get some professional help. There are actually therapists, um, both traditional therapists and hypnotherapists and folks who actually do work with bar studiers or people getting ready to study for the bar because testing anxiety is so crippling. It can cause very, very brilliant people to to just completely bomb this test. Um, yeah, I mean, I think, you know, with the students, a lot of them that we work with, I think, you know, for a huge percentage, that's at least some portion of the problem. And in some cases, it's really the whole problem. Yeah. So don't leave this to the last minute. If testing anxiety is something you struggled with in law school, but you're like, nah, like, it's okay, you know? I'll, I'll handle it for I'll the bar. I'll handle it cool. fine. It'll be, it'll be easier for the bar. That's not true. I would it's just going to get worse. It's going to get worse. So I would suggest, um, you know, really looking at your resources and trying to get as much help as you can so you're not going into um, bar prep, you know, worried about that kind of stuff. Yeah, I think it's just, you know, you got to get the rest of your life in order. Yeah. Um, like, these are, you know, these are just things that you can't be dealing with, like, life issues and be passing the bar at the same time. I mean, that being said, you know, horrible things happen to people during their bar prep and they sit for it and pass. But ideally, you know, go back to our listening to Avoiding Disasters podcast for, you know, tips on avoiding disaster. But this is, you know, planning ahead, like, thinking about where you're going to live, that kind of thing. The other thing in that, I mean... You know, I think we have a blog post on this. There's no reason you can't just like to camp to a beach somewhere nice in the world and study for the bar. Yep. Um, I mean, you know, you don't have to live in like a really high cost area of living. You could literally spend two months in Bali and probably mm-hmm. spend less money on housing than you would in most cities in America. And oh, you might be a lot more relaxed. Yeah, it's true. I mean, I think you just think outside the box of really what you need. Um, and what's going to be good for you. Um, yeah, I mean, for me, like when I was studying, I actually got an unlimited yoga pass and I would literally go sometimes twice a day. Mm-hmm. And if, eventually after I'm showing up morning and evening <laughs> every day, they're kind of like, what are you doing? Mm-hmm. I'm like, I'm studying for the bar. They're like, oh, maybe you should come three times. How about lunch? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I mean, I've actually had a lot of people tell me uh, that the most like the healthiest and most fit they've ever been is during bar prep because a lot of people will give up drinking and they work out all the time and they maybe get regular sleep or they kind of don't do a lot of activities that lead you to be fairly unhealthy it's pretty funny so yeah your house might be super clean Mm -hmm. you're getting a massage regularly exactly exactly (laughs) point is you can do that you can do whatever makes you the most productive studier that you can be exactly um Another thing to think about is if you are someone who has gotten accommodations throughout law school um, for 
any sort of disability or learning disability, physical or learning disability, and you are going to apply for those accommodations from the state bar during the bar exam time, please, please, please do not leave this to the last minute. Um, Oftentimes it's more difficult to get accommodations from the bar for the bar exam, and sometimes you even will get your accommodations rejected and you need to appeal. So don't wait till the summer to do this because it is also a huge distraction if you are trying to get accommodations while you're studying. Um, So, you know, you should talk to the people you need to now get the documentation that you need, um, get in line, all of those things that need to get done so you can apply as early as possible and make sure you know the conditions in which you're going to have to take this exam. Yeah, absolutely. You want to know that sooner rather than later. You don't want to be dealing with it in the weeks leading up to the exam. No, miserable, miserable. And the other thing that's come up a lot, which is an issue in a lot of states, is like maybe you're going to be breastfeeding. Oh, yeah. You know, there are like all kinds of like situations on that one. But, you know, these are things like you've just got to sort of plan ahead. Like, okay, what am I going to need to deal with to make sure that I have the best possible shot at like a fairer examination? It's true. And find out this the state's policies on that stuff early because maybe even you need to challenge them <laughs> on what their right. policies are. But, you know, waiting until you're a week before the exam and you're like, oh, I'm a breastfeeding mama. How are you going to accommodate me? You don't want that to be the time that you find out the state's policies. Yeah, because they're probably not going to be very favorable. Unfortunately not. No. And you can, uh, if you'd like to read people's crazy stories about stuff like that, Above the Law always has great stories about stuff like that, (laughs) (laughs) about all of those situations that come up. Uh, So you can read up on other people's experiences. But again, this theme of not waiting until the bar prep period to get all of your ducks in a row, I think is very important. Yeah, no, I agree. So, I mean, okay, we've talked a lot about one or two L's and three L's. Like, I'm a one L. What can I do to prepare for the bar exam? All right. So don't sign up for your bar prep program. You don't need to. They'll tell you it's cheaper. I don't necessarily think that ever comes out to be all that true. Um, so you're not going to know what kind of bar prep you're going to need when you're a first-year law student because you don't know what kind of law student you are yet. So wait. It's fine. You can try yeah, things Yeah, I mean, out. even if it's like a couple hundred dollars more, it's worth it. totally worth it. Totally Just worth not. It. I mean, totally worth it. Even if you end up buying it in the end, like at least you made an informed choice. Yeah. The most important thing a 1L can do is working on your study skills and excelling at these first year classes. You know, that list of the subjects that I gave earlier, a good chunk of those you take in your first year. The core bar curriculum is your first year classes. (laughs) So, and and keep your notes. And keep your notes, keep your flow charts, keep your flashcards even if you want to, because going back and revisiting that stuff can be easier from your own materials. But yeah, what, I, what I've often heard from people who've struggled with the bar exam is, well, I was a really terrible student my first year, but then after my first year, I just started taking a lot of classes where I could write papers. And then my <laughs> grades went up, so I thought I'd be fine. If you're struggling with exams in your first year, that typically is going to... Um, it's not a good sign. No, it's not a good sign for the future. So work on your exam skills now. Use the resources at your school. Use academic support. Use your professors. Get a tutor. Whatever you need to do to become a better student because that's going to not only help your overall GPA in law school, which is good for everything, jobs, future prospects, all of that stuff, but it's going to help you be a better bar taker as well. Yeah, I mean, you know, we can often predict like, okay, looking at your 1L grades, And the fact that you didn't really like do anything to improve on these skills going forward and you just kind of like papered over it by taking paper classes or seminars or whatever. It's like I can pretty much tell you you're at very high risk of failing the bar. Yeah. And actually, my school used to release bar passage by class rankings. Which Um, is highly correlated. Which is highly correlated. You know, I think um, it's like if you were the top – 10-15% 10-15% of class you had a 99 to 100% chance of passing the bar and then right. as you went down um, the class ranking it got harder and harder and it's just and it just makes sense exam taking skills are just exam taking skills they don't right go and this away. is not to you know this is not to scare people who are maybe at the bottom of the curve but it's really to say look this is something you need to take seriously exactly you know you still have time to make this not an issue for yourself on the day that you sit for the bar but if you don't do anything about it you're at very high risk of failing the bar. Right. And I think it's actually terrible that the law schools don't talk to one else more about this because that's the time where you can really start making the changes to right. help you when you graduate. Um, it's To me, it's sad when somebody graduates with this false sense of security that they may have gotten up their GPA, but they haven't bettered their exam taking skills. And then they get into a cycle of failing the bar exam, which is an expensive and really personally challenging thing to go to. If that can be avoided... 
than it should be. Yeah, it's just so demoralizing. It is. And, you know, it's not something you want to be dealing with if you can avoid it at all. That being said, if you are in that situation and you do fail the bar, there are plenty of ways you can get back on track and pass again. <laughs> so it's not like it's like it's not impossible. It's, it's just not something impossible. that ideally you would not go through right. if you can avoid it. If you can avoid it, I would rather that not be a life experience you have to live through. There's yeah. plenty it of other things. Char- could be character building, but you know, so are lots of other things. <laughs> exactly. exactly. Like going to yoga school, you know, <laughs> it might be more fun than failing the bar. <laughs> That's right. That's right. All right. So those are just things to keep in mind as a one L. Just, you know, don't. Don't just think I don't have to pay attention to any of this stuff because it's so far away. Just keep it in mind that the ultimate test of your exam taking abilities will come um, after you graduate. And so you're working on those skills the whole time you're in law school. Yeah. And if you don't pass, like you can't practice law. Yep. That's kind of a big problem. It's a big problem. So and with that, we are out of time. If you enjoyed this episode of the Law School Toolbox podcast, even if it made you a little nervous about bar prep, we're sorry about that. (laughs) Please take a second to leave a review and rating on iTunes. We'd really appreciate it. And be sure to subscribe so you don't miss anything. If you have any questions or comments, please don't hesitate to reach out to Lee and Allison, um, Lee at lawschooltoolbox.com or Allison at lawschooltoolbox.com. Or you can always contact us via our website contact form at lawschooltoolbox.com. One more plug, we do also have um, a website called the Bar Exam Toolbox, baregamtoolbox.com, which is full of a lot of um, free tips and resources about taking the bar exam. So if we did make you nervous by doing this podcast, please check out some of the tips and tools we have on there. Um, and hopefully they can make you feel better about going into your bar prep season. Definitely. And if you happen to fail, we have lots of stories from people who failed and came back and survived. So exactly. It's not the end of the world. It is not the end of the world. It's not a pleasant experience. No, but um, but do reach out and read those stories um, because I think they will make you feel better about um, about the position you're in, whether or not you're waiting for results or you're starting to study or you've gotten disappointing results. And with that, thank you for listening and we will talk soon. Bye.